Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, thank you all for being here at our uh, Integrative Medicine Grand Round Series. Uh, today, we're really thrilled to have our colleagues from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, presenting a uh, case on understanding the role of acupuncture in head and neck cancer through a case study. And uh, it's my really distinct honor to uh, present uh, Dr. Wei Dong Lu, who is uh, uh, the uh, principal investigator at the Dana Farber uh, Cancer Institute on the Traditional Chinese Medicine Research Initiative. In addition, he's a professor of Chinese medicine at the New England School of Acupuncture as well. He also sits on the board on, um, for the Committee on Acupuncture at the Board of Medicine as well. And he has multiple degrees and has really uh, was the first recipient of the uh, K Award awarded to a non uh, P, uh, physician uh, through the NCC, uh, what is now known as the National Center for Complementary Integrative Health. Um, we also have our discussants, Dr. Danielle Margalit, who is also uh, a radiation oncologist, is assistant professor of radiation oncology here at Harvard Medical School and a member of the Head and Neck Oncology Program. She also has multiple distinguished awards, which you can read on her bio uh, in, in the program. And uh, with that, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Wei Dong Lu. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to share with you the cases that we're, and Dr. Magalit uh, work together, and our uh, patient, uh, Mr. Smith, and uh, here with us, as, uh, he will share with you uh, about his personal experience uh, regarding his cancer journey. So that, um, so let's see, uh, the, today we talk about is the head neck cancer. So what is a head neck cancer? Uh, many people are not aware of this because head neck cancer only counts about 3% to 5% of all the cancers in the United States. So relatively a small cancer. However, there's about over 60,000 patients diagnosed every year in the United States. Worldwide, there's over 550,000 new cases. Head neck cancer are cancers that occur in the, uh, where oral cavity, uh, pharynx, larynx, sinus, nasal cavity, and the salivary glands. So that part of the body, if it's a better cancer, we call the head neck cancer. And these days is a standard care, including surgery, radiation, um, chemotherapy, or combination of a chemo radiation therapy. Now these days, um, immunotherapy also is becoming a standard care of a head neck cancer. Uh, these are famous people who actually had a cancer, uh, uh, had that cancer. You probably recognize their faces because we just had Oscar last weekend. And uh, so the case we want to share with you today is a 61-year-old male. And uh, in the uh, 2000, August of 2020, uh, 2015, and he noticed there's a painless lump in his neck. Then a, a week later, he went to his physician, and uh, uh, his PCP also confirmed this uh, enlarged lymph nodes, and uh, so he ordered an ultrasound. A um, day later, he received an ultrasound, and subsequently, the CT scan revealed this abnormal uh, mass in the, his uh, base of his tongue, and come with a multiple enlarged cystic lymph nodes in the left neck. The, he received the fine needle aspiration that revealed the P16 positive um, squamous cell carcinoma um, in uh, November 20, uh, 2015. And he was taken into the operating room and had a, a biopsy. And that further confirmed he has a primary site is on, on his left uh, base of a tongue. And he diagnosed with a squamous cell carcinoma of a left tongue base. And his stage was stage, clinical stage was stage 4A. Um, so this is uh, his, uh, uh, at the time, diagnosed his PET scan and the CT scan, and you can look at this, uh, um, I hope, yeah, this is an uh, enlarged lymph node, this is a light up of the PET scan, this is a cancer right here, on the here, right in large lymph nodes, and uh, um, presenting him. So he was offered, uh, with a standard of care at that time, is a, called a, a combination of a radiation and a chemotherapy. He was receiving uh, every day daily radiation and combined with a con concurrent uh, cisplatin chemotherapy given every three weeks uh, during this time. Um, in September, 
2015, he started the uh, same day with uh, uh, cisplatin chemotherapy and uh, radiation. Um, his uh, dosage of a radiation plan was a 7,000 C grade, which is considered to be very high, um, strong radiation treatment. Two weeks later, he was placed on a feeding tube. Uh, the reason he on a feeding tube is that uh, uh, during the radiation, many patients will have a trouble swallow and eating food. And uh, to, in order to support his uh, nutritional supply, and uh, he was given the feeding tube. Um, by November 2015, he finished the uh, three cycle of the chemotherapy, and a week later, uh, on November 17, 2015, he completed he, all his uh, radiation treatment. At that time, the patient suffering a severe uh, uh, side effects, including loss of taste, dry mouth, xerostomia, and uh, fatigue, insomnia. Uh, at that time, he was not able to eat food through his mouth. He was using these uh, uh, four to five cartoon and uh, uh, protein shakes uh, via his uh, pack, uh, feeding pad, uh, feeding tube every day. He tried to eat some food, but was not successful. He tried the uh, noodles, wandan food, pizza, uh, was, not, was not going well. Um, but he was able to drink coffee at the time. Um, he had constipation, manager with uh, 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 center and uh, colace. He tried to walk every day, and uh, he sleep okay, but uh, it was uh, disrupted by dry mouth. Every, he wakes up every few hours. Uh, he used a humidify. He denied fever and chills at the time, and he developed some kind of uh, tinnitus in the ear, but it only lasts about 15 seconds. Um, so at that time, he does not have any uh, complaint of the tingling, numbness on his hands and feet, which means that he did not have uh, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy at the time. So this is the cartoon shows the pack, uh, which is a feeding tube, but typically used in the head and neck cancer. Um, the, the pad is that basically surgically you dig a hole in the, the stomach and the abdominal wall and plus a tube here and they use the food and uh, liquid food to go through your tube and every day. That is commonly used for many cancer patients, particularly head and neck cancer patients, while they are not able to eat through their mouth because of the radiation and uh, uh, causing the side effects. This is his uh, uh, symptom score at the time of the visit. And you can see he has a lot of uh, very severe fatigue, dry mouth, lack of taste, and insomnia. These are our acupuncture. We started acupuncture in the December 2015. These are points that we're using throughout time, not all at once, but uh, at different phases. So basically, he um, had a, a two phases of acupuncture treatment. In the first 200 days, once he started acupuncture, he used it twice a week and gave a total of about 15 sessions. And the second phase, he took a break and for six months and come back in early of 2017 and for, with a different complaint. And that was at that time, we, he only doing once a week. Um, so the, that's a, his the utilization of the acupuncture. Uh, and the, particularly, you can see in Brownish, he's uh, using uh, only second to uh, head neck cancer oncology. He used a lot of acupuncture during his treatment in two years of a period of time. So let's uh, welcome uh, Mr. Smith, and uh, he's a patient, and uh, let, let him to share with you about uh, his personal experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good, Good morning. My name is Howard, uh, and slightly over two years ago, uh, Dr. Margulie, uh provided me with a diagnosis of oral pharyngeal cancer. Uh, which at the time I took as a combination of good news and bad news. Uh, the good news was Dr. Marguerite was confident that she was going to be able to resolve uh, the cancer. Uh, the bad news was that the treatment would trigger this whole bucket of side effects, and moreover, it wasn't clear to us at the time that there would be uh, how the side effects would resolve, if at all. And so I'm here this morning just to make a few comments about my treatment of those side effects. Um, but as you've heard, the treatment itself just consisted of 35 days of uh, radiation each morning uh, fall and interspersed with uh, three infusions of uh, chemotherapy. And so uh, the treatment was explained to me as being harsh and needless to say uh, the description was accurate. Um, 
Uh, one point, uh, I look, looking back on the course of treatment was remarkable uh, how quickly I went from feeling well to being sick. There seemed to be a very steep angle of descent from the day I was doing well to the day um, everything seemed to turn around for the worse. Uh, so there was a lot going uh, wrong all at once, uh, but in particular for me, a lot of my struggles physically and emotionally were just focused on this peg tube. Um, so I went through my treatment over the course of those seven weeks, and then uh, everything seemed to... Uh, Everything seemed to uh, not be going anywhere. Um, and fortunately, Dr. Margleet again, uh, had been referring me to the Zakem Center. But you saw that graph of appointments I was coping with. There was really no opportunity physically or emotionally to add appointments. But I did uh, I get over there about two weeks after my treatment ended. And... Uh, what, was, what really impressed me right off the start was how the acupuncture team just extended to me their confidence that their treatments could make a difference uh, with these side effects. I had had no prior experience uh, with acupuncture. The nature of acupuncture was unknown to me. What they were going to do was unknown to me. The impacts were unknown to me. But something happened right off the start, which is getting into these treatments created this rhythm and soon the rhythm created some kind of movement with my side effects. And so that sense of movement or progress uh, expressed itself in two different ways. Certain progress was slow and gradual, and other progress was immediate, which was sort of the case with the peg tube. And what I'm about to say, this story with how this peg tube uh, came out, um, is going to sound a little unusual. I'm fine. Thank you. Um, but this is uh, accurately uh, how it happened. And uh, so one of the details of the acupuncture treatment involves this current that's introduced uh, through my skull, through the acupuncture needles, uh, and there's a power pack connected through electrodes through the needles, which in turn generates this ripple or wave-like pattern through my skull, and it repeats every three to four seconds. And it's kind of an overpowering sense. Um, but having said that, typically I would just in the session fall asleep. The session I'm about to describe to you, however, I didn't fall asleep. But to the contrary, I really just shifted into this higher sense of mental clarity. And keep in mind, the room is very quiet. And at, at this particular moment, I started a sense of just gaining this widespread perspective. And that's when, just remember, the, the room is quiet. Uh, but in my mind, the lyrics to this song popped into my head. And it's not like the song was playing in the room. And so this is an old Jerry Garcia ballad. And I've been listening to this and thinking of this song for 40 years. And honestly, it's never had any particular meaning to me. And though I'm familiar with the song, like who knows what the, the meaning of these lyrics may be. But these are the lyrics that came to me as I was floating off the gurney up there, I believe, on Yawkey 6, uh, as Dr. Lou was treating me. And suddenly, listening to these lyrics, what came to my mind was what everybody had done for me to get me to the point where I was, that Dr. Margalik, Dr. Chow, Dr. Lou, the acupuncture team, uh, the clinicians, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, but it extends on to, you know, the people at the reception desk who said good morning to me every morning, the people who helped me park my car. Um, everybody had done all of this just to get me to where I was, and what became immediately clear to me was that I was at a point where I myself had to take the next step, which came down to, for me, dealing with the peg tube and more specifically going home to start eating, which wasn't at all an easy concept uh, considering that, you know, at this point, I don't know how many uh, weeks or months it had been since I, I had eaten anything, and certainly I, I was barely able to swallow, and my mouth and throat were totally dry. Um, and so the objective was at that point to go uh, two weeks eating only by mouth without losing weight. And to that point, I had just been losing weight day by day. 
But I did commit to the objective, and I'm just going to try and move forward here before I get any time warning. Um, and so two weeks later, after eating this combination of uh, oatmeal and wonton noodle soup and some eggs, it really turned out, uh, as a head and neck patient, finding foods that you can eat are a total adventure. And I can tell you just flat out that you can walk through the whole Longwood medical area, and in none of these buildings are there foods that any of us can eat. Um, so, but in any case, two weeks later, I presented, and Dr. Chow uh, gave me the all clear to have the peg tube removed. And so the peg tube was removed. This is a, doctor, a slide Dr. Liu put together. Uh, apparently, my peg tube was removed 79 days after it was put in, and I really didn't understand or appreciate at the time whether that was uh, early or the middle of the game or late in the game. Uh, but I've got to tell you, today, looking back, I'm very happy to be on the left side of this graph because being on the left side of this graph meant a whole lot to me. Um, first, you know, in the sense I can say unequivocally that being in acupuncture I made a, a huge difference in accelerating the removal of my PEG tube. The second and somewhat broader point is that with the tube out, I was unable to somewhat jumpstart the next steps in my treatment, which for me involved uh, participating in a Livestrong exercise class uh, at our local Y, which was just, to my good fortune, starting up within a couple of weeks of when I had my tube removed. Point being, if I had had my tube uh, in place, I never would have participated in that class because with the tube in, I just felt way too exposed. Um, I also, as Dr. Liu said, I've stated acupuncture for the treatment of so many other side effects, and it's a, a moderately long list. Um, I feel mostly fortunate to have made progress with my dry mouth, my sense of taste, I have neuropathy in my feet. I've lost a ton of hearing, and on and on and on. But I sort of believe that the road and the door is still open for me to make more recovery. And so just as my final slide is, the point is um, that, you know, I, I came to understand the point of this whole You've Got Us tagline, which uh, in my case really comes down to how well my team communicated how they were constantly there for me, physically and emotionally. Um, and so just to wrap up, I really am thankful to each uh, person who contributed to my care and just want to say I have a lot to be thankful for, and I want to thank the Osher Center for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And, uh, uh, our patients are always the, the motivation driver to have a more innovation and then try to serve them better. So this uh, uh, second time when he comes back, uh, he had new symptoms. Uh, he, had, uh, uh, he, he was complaining that he had a tingling numbness developed on his hand and the feet, which is a neuropathy. And in addition to his, uh, uh, the, the dry mouth and fatigue, his fatigue was resolved at the first phase of a treatment, but he continued to have a dry mouth uh, ongoing can see as no treatment, uh, no changes uh, from the, the, these numbers. So this is a, uh, uh, his lack of a taste change over the time, first phase of 200 days. Um, this is a fatigue score changes uh, over the first phase of his acupuncture treatment. And uh, so um, in the second phase of his treatment, after he take a break, he come back and had another uh, treatment, he had quite a response, because at that time, we were focused on his neuropathy. So he had quite a response uh, for the neuropathy symptoms, and, you know, in num particular numbness uh, in the feet, and uh, re improved significantly quickly. Uh, you can see here, this is a score before and after the treatment uh, and changes, uh, after only about uh, six times of uh, uh, visits. So this is a change of the percentage change of his uh, neuropathy symptoms, which is the clinically significant changes uh, on him. So looking back now, even today, uh, Mr. Smith still comes to the Zakem Center, and he's still receiving his acupuncture treatment, maybe not as frequent as before. Look at his dry mouth. And from the beginning of December, when he started acupuncture, until uh, this month. And uh, his neuropathy, at the first of a year, there's practically no change. But now, starting to see he become, he still have a neuropathy, uh, but he still have a dry mouth, but not dry mouth, it is mild, very mild. 
And that's his neuropathy changes and uh, from the beginning until uh, this month. So you can see there is a change um, uh, throughout the time. His pack, as he mentioned, was quickly removed, and which is, relatively speaking, the shorter than most of the study presented data uh, here. So what is acupuncture? Acupuncture, we know, is the, uh, many people in this room don't need a lot of explanation about acupuncture. And this is a, describe a family procedure involved stimulation in the anatomical location of the skin and by a variety of techniques. So mostly we use this as a fine needle stimulation. Uh, at Zikam Center, our goal is to integrate the practice of a com uh, complementary therapy into traditional cancer care. Zikam Center was founded in the 2000, so it's 17 years now and almost 18 years. These are our uh, acupuncture team and that's been working in past 17 years. Some have uh, um, been there for a long time, so they've newly joined us on the team. Um, so this is our uh, practice profile in 2016. We see a lot of uh, breast cancer patients, hematological cancer patients, head neck cancer patients, and uh, a whole bunch of other cancers. So you can see we have a wide range of a spectrum of patient population we are serving. And uh, so now that I have a Dr. Maglitz to share with uh, her perspective from a um, radiation oncologist perspective. Let's welcome Dr. Maglitz. So um, what I wanted to do is just share with you um, how sort of the allopathic side of traditional treatment of head and neck cancer um, and how we aim to reduce these side effects that Howard was describing to you. Uh, because there are just so many, um, you know, side effects that happen. And things like dry mouth are just, you know, so dramatic because... Um, it really affects the patient's ability to swallow when food is sticking to the back. People lose their sense of taste, and all these symptoms contribute to really um, very significant anorexia and inability to swallow, and hence the feeding tube. Um, and just to set it in context additionally, uh, head and neck cancer is really increasing in incidence and you can see on the left, the upgoing line is really these tr predominantly virally mediated head and neck cancers, um, mostly HPV, which is in the news quite a bit. So that in some sort of demographic segments, uh, particularly men um, in the sort of range of late 50s or early 60s, it's actually becoming the number six cause of cancer. Um, whereas other head and neck cancers, which are the downsloping lines, are the ones that are more traditionally associated with alcohol and tobacco. And it, on the right, you can see other, another virally mediated cancer, which is cervical cancer, for which we have a good screening tool, which we don't for head and neck cancer, uh, besides a physical exam. Um, the yellow open circles are cervical cancer, so that rate continues to be projected to go down, whereas for head and neck cancer, the yellow upsloping lines, um, it continues to, to go up and is projected to do so. Um, so radiation therapy or, and or surgery are the main curative ways to treat the cancer, and we often give chemotherapy to enhance the radiation. And the good news, you know, as Howard mentioned, is that cure rates are, are actually quite good in general. And so more people are entering the survivorship phase and are going to be living with these side effects for many decades to come. And, and so it really just highlights the importance of focusing on acute and long-term side effect management uh, while maintaining the good cure rates. Uh, in general these side effects from radiation therapy are mostly produced by radiation dose to the normal tissue. And we don't intend to give radiation dose to the normal tissue, but it's an innocent bystander. When the radiation we're trying to get to the tumor or the lymph node chains, the normal tissues uh, that are embedded in the normal tissue. So for example, when an organ like the saliva gland gets a lot of radiation dose, it leads to dry mouth, which leads to uh, potentially dental cavities. 
when the mucosa of the mouth and throat gets a lot of radiation, that you get the mouth sores. The swallowing muscles, when they're exposed to high dose, leads to dysphagia and motility difficulties, and the list goes on. So the goal when we create a radiation plan is how do we maximize the chance of cure and treat the tumor and the potential areas of where the tumor could spread in the head and neck um, while minimizing the dose to the organs and minimizing side effects. So it's how what we can do from, from this you know, allopathic side to minimize side effects, which we work very hard to do. And I'm just going to give you one example of how a big evolution in uh, technology and treatment technique that occurred um, has led to improvement in side effects. We've still got a long way to go. Um, this was a transition mostly in the early 2000s of an older radiation technique called conventional radiation, where we had a really limited ability to shape the radiation beam to the newer uh, technique called intensity modulated radiation therapy, where beams come from multiple angles and we can shape the beams better. And that was made possible by software innovation and innovation in the hardware of the actual treatment delivery machine. And that's shown in these little figures where on the left um, is just a lateral view of an x-ray. So the beams would usually come in from um, limited angles, like two angles from the side and one from the front, couldn't shape the dose much. Whereas now, on the right, the beams come from all angles and are shaped better. Um, so it, it's the technology, the software, but it's also the radiation oncologist needs to carefully delineate where is the tumor, where could it spread, and the organs that we don't want to get radiated um, in order to use the software to avoid these tissues. So you can see on the right is a sagittal CAT scan, and the red um, is outlining, for example, um, the general region of uh, where uh, um, Howard's tumor was at the back of the tongue, um, which you can see was resting right over the epiglottis, a key swallowing structure, but then also outlined, of course, is the spinal cord and the mandible and the oral cavity, many areas that we want to avoid. And here is what can happen when we use this new technology. On the left is, you can see the color is in the shape of a rectangle. And with the older technique, this is the kind of shape of radiation that, that one could get. And the red arrow points to one of the ma main saliva glands, the parotid gland, which are just completely encompassed by the radiation, which is the, the colors, in order to get to this midline tumor. Whereas with the newer technique, these parotid glands can now be better avoided, uh, as you can see on the right. They're not encompassed by the colored lines. So not only can we avoid these normal organs better, but the good part is it does translate to improved side effects. So there have been at least three randomized trials, um, and this is fairly unusual where technology is actually shown to have a benefit in randomized trial settings. Um, where patients are randomized to the older technique, where you couldn't spare the saliva gland very well, to the newer technique, IMRT, where the, the main saliva gland, the parotid gland, was avoided. And this led to significant improvements in all trials in measurements of salivary flow, in objective reports, and then most importantly, patient-reported outcome. Um, so there we've made a lot of progress in trying to use technology to improve side effects. And here's another example of um, the individual radiation oncologist um, using IMRT to try spare side effects. So on the left, you can see there's a blue line. Um, and everything within the blue line got about 60 gray, which is considered a, quite a high dose of radiation. But the doses we have to use in general, forehead neck cancer. And in this setting, uh, the cricopharyngeous muscle, a, care, a key swallowing muscle, was included. And that led to the development of a stricture. And the patient eventually had a dilation and was able to go on and, and eat a regular diet. But on the right is how we plan patients here. Um, 
which is that we spare where the red arrow is pointing to the midline swallowing structures. So it leads to a lot less dose, and therefore this patient did not develop a stricture. So here's some examples of how we do our part and keep working towards minimizing side effects, um, such as dry mouth and swallowing problems. And what has been, you know, one of the amazing things of, of working um, uh, at Dana-Farber is, again, as Howard mentioned, the incredible team approach. And so it's been a real privilege to work with Dr. Liu and his colleagues. And, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, the integrative care helps patients get through treatment. And we have got a lot of data that if patients start missing treatments, their radiation treatments, and the treatment then is extended over a longer period, it leads to lower rates of cure. So we have, we have to get people through this very difficult treatment and, you know, through acupuncture and, you know, the other integrative modalities, it helps patients get there. It helps promote long-term well-being as people go into the survivorship phase. And from a practical level, it's really helpful to have this under one roof because the communication is so key. You know, we know where each other are in their respective treatment courses. Uh, we can communicate about what areas are going to get a lot of dermatitis, perhaps where you want to maybe avoid placing needles at least during treatment. Um, and so it, it's, it's a wonderful program, and, and I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share a little bit today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maglitt, for your perspective. And uh, so this, uh, um, yes, at Dana-Farber, we really try to integrate the conventional uh, medicine with uh, our complementary therapy together, which is our unique feature here. So looking back, and uh, um, oncology acupuncture is very new uh, area of the research and uh, uh, medical service. And then looking at these, uh, the data show this from the PubMed, this uh, research data on uh, acupuncture used for cancer population, it's just recent phenomena. And only approximately about the past 15 years. So very new, there's a lot of things happening, but this is a very fast growing area. Um, so the, um, the evidence from uh, clinical trials suggests that acupuncture uh, really could help the cancer patient during the particular head neck cancer patient during their uh, cancer treatment. One study showed that they can prevent and improve this radiation-induced xerostomia. Um, this is not just uh, treating them, but also prevent it. And also, and, uh, for people who already have uh, xerostomia, and acupuncture also could help to treating patients with xerostomia. And the second part is acupuncture can improve the function and neck pain after uh, the surgery, had, uh, neck dissection, which many patients have a neck pain and could be a chronic pain. The third area is possibly that the, our study also find that acupuncture could possibly improve swallow-related quality of life and shorten the feeding tube durations, as illustrated by the uh, Mr. Smith's the cases here. And the last one is acupuncture also could help to uh, reduce the other non-specific symptoms, including the anxiety, fatigue, which is very common among the cancer patients, and before, during, and after the cancer treatment. These are some of our randomized trials has been published uh, in recent, uh, recent um, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, one study is uh, um, from Shanghai, published in Cancer in 2012. It was using acupuncture to prevent radiation-induced xerostomia. They gave acupuncture um, simultaneously with the patient already uh, just starting radiation and watch how they, uh, the xerostomia uh, developed and compare with the sham acupuncture. Uh, that was a possible study. And uh, another thing is acupuncture treating the chronic xerostomia. A patient has xerostomia for a long time, and, uh, and uh, over several months, even years after, and uh, they found acupuncture still be uh, useful and helpful to reduce the, the severity of xerostomia. The, um, in New York, uh, the Sloan Catering, New York um, uh, Cancer Center uh, published the data uh, with uh, the use of acupuncture for pain and dysfunction after neck, neck uh, dissection. Uh, that was uh, published in the JCO in 2010. And uh, um, 2016, um, our group at uh, Dana-Farber with Dr. Meg Lee and Head Neck uh, Oncology at Dana-Farber, uh, we did a study that published uh, 
another randomized kind of trial results of the chemotherapy, um, acupuncture for chemo radiation induced the, the dysphagia. And that was a pilot um, uh, the study. We only had 42 uh, patients, and we would like to see if that uh, this group of patients can tolerate the acupuncture and uh, in, uh, have them to recruit them into this study and finish it. And uh, so this is the results. So we find that um, during the treatment after the um, baseline to the 12 months after, and we used the acupuncture versus sham control, and we find that both group had a significant improvement from a baseline to end of this 12 months but a stay period time. The acupuncture had a 13% of improvement in this particular uh, dysphagia specific uh, questionnaire called the MDADI, have a 13% improvement and, uh, from the baseline to 12 months after the finish radiation. And uh, on this particular MDADI globe subscale, um, acupuncture had a 51% improvement in this group of patients. However, we did not see the difference between sham acupuncture versus the real acupuncture for very re many different reasons. So uh, it, the result here is a pre a preliminary data. Doesn't matter what kind of acupuncture you're getting. If you get acupuncture, you will have an improvement, but there's no difference and between sham and uh, real acupuncture. That will lead us now we're planning a new study and uh, try to look into deeper the mechanism and the specific population in, uh, to improve this uh, outcome. So we try to uh, planning uh, another study uh, at this time. So the um, NCCN, which is a very authoritative group uh, in the United States uh, that the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, there is an um, organization issued a practice guideline for oncology. So how to do chemotherapy, how to do radiation, and all issued by the NCCN. And the NCCN, this group, also endorsed and support use of acupuncture during cancer treatment. Um, in these five areas, in the increasing cancer pain and anti-MSs and the cancer-related fatigues and the palliative care and the survivorship. Um, this is currently exist in the, uh, in the NCC practice guideline and the acupuncture has been mentioned and, uh, and supported. So what is oncology acupuncture? This is a very new area. We use traditional conventional acupuncture into the oncology setting. And uh, these are our uh, four features of the oncology acupuncture. It has standardized procedure, lab-based safety rules, evidence-based um, protocols, and uh, quantified outcomes. Cancer is a long journey. And it started from uh, prevention, diagnosis, active treatment, follow-up, and a survivorship. So it's a very long journey and it does not go away quickly. And during active treatment, there are four, now so far there's four um, standard of care um, therapies, the surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and uh, hormones uh, therapy. Acupuncture actually could help all of them, all of them, and uh, in the different stages and to minimize side effects. And the, particularly in these uh, four symptoms groups, uh, pain, including cancer pain, or pathological uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, nerve pain, including like a neuropathy type of pain, and the surgical related pain, nausea, vomiting from a chemotherapy, dry mouth, as I mentioned that, and the hot flashes. And uh, so these are four areas that we're really focused on with, uh, on chemo, uh, with the acupuncture. And uh, in addition, during the active treatment, acupuncture also appeared to be very, very useful in the follow-up and the survivorship. Um, the patient who already finished all the active treatment and the patient is still coming back and we find that still can provide, reduce their side effects. So this is a very important to many patients and, and the survivorship of phase. So what did we learn here? We learned here is that the support, care, supportive care in the head and neck uh, cancer patient provides a benefit to improve the quality of life during and after chemo rating radiation therapy. Evidence supports that the use of acupuncture in cancer symptom management for cancer survivors. And integrating acupuncture into conventional cancer treatment, it is possible. And our uh, experience in past 17 years and uh, supporting that. And uh, required, but we need to require continuous research to generate more evidence, including the clinical benefits, as well as uh, underlying mechanisms. So this is what we're going uh, to do. So um, we stop here. Thank you very much. And 
We're ready to answer some questions for you. Uh, first of all, I want to just extend a deep gratitude to uh, Mr. Smith for sharing uh, your story with us. Really, thank you for, for that uh, uh, courage uh, to share and, and for us to be able to learn. And thank you to uh, Dr. Wei Dong Lu and Dr. Margalit for such an amazing and very thoughtful and thorough presentation. So uh, with that, I hope this has stirred uh, quite a bit of dialogue uh, amongst all of you. So we will invite, please raise your hand and we will invite you to speak into the mic uh, so that um, people can hear as well. And it's being live streamed so others can hear who as well. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, speak, if you speak really closely, there we go. Well, this is, uh, uh, we could have a sham acupuncture conference for uh, three days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, is that, yes, this is a, a very hot, hot debate area, and we need to understand more. Uh, currently, the sham acupuncture is using um, the different methods to apply for the sham acupuncture. We call it, try to, the idea is try to use a fake acupuncture and uh, try to uh, fool the patient that thought they are getting a real uh, acupuncture, but actually they didn't. But now the, these days, uh, so the acupuncture using one of the uh, typical using is a device that uh, the needles um, retract back into the uh, acupuncture uh, needle handles and without the insert into the skin. So that is uh, what we call that sham acupuncture. But there's many other devices. Is that what you've done in your study, or did the needle actually? Well, our study the sham acupuncture. Uh, it's different than we didn't use that particular device because for economic reason it was very expensive. <laughs> we couldn't, couldn't afford that. And we did use the uh, penetrable uh, needles, but a very uh, thin and uh, um, off the meridians, traditional placement, and, uh, and the very thin insertions without too much stimulation. Thank you. Wait on, just as a follow-up to that question, where did you measure if the patients were blinded? Did they know if they were getting sham or was, that, was it equal? Oh, yes. They, the, the patient was completely blind. They, didn't, they really were not aware which one uh, they are getting uh, during the treatment um, uh, before after. Actually, we tried to blind the uh, fold of them. So, and then we also questioned them afterwards and see if they uh, do know whether they, what, what kind of action they're getting. But uh, uh, the data come back that suggests they they most of they don't know um, what they're getting. Okay. Uh, Linda. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Linda. Yeah. Um, I, I was, it's a wonderful presentation, all of you. And, and you guys. Um, I particularly wanted to hear a little uh, more about that moment where you uh, had the lyrics to that entire song come back with the waves of acupuncture stimulation. Um, I'm an integrated mind body. I, I think those moments of heightened, uh, almost whole lifespan and subjective integration with a whole, with the entire lyrics of a song like that coming back are, in my mind, kind of signal events of, of every, every molecule, every um, chi, all, all, everything that's available to the person in their life is kind of coming together in a sort of integrated moment. Um, and I don't know if, if it felt like the treatment was turning around at that point, but I, it just seemed like a subjective um, kind of turning point. So the moment was in December 2015, but it's still very, it's crystal clear to me today. And what's crystal clear is that it was truly a tipping point from where I had been before to where I went afterwards. Um, and again, there I was in, you know, I believe the sixth floor of the Yawkey building. Uh, and it was, you know, in, in the past treatments, I had just fallen off to sleep because the whole treatment process is so relaxing, which makes this con a, a huge contrast to the other experiences. I had had in the two weeks leading up to that moment. So it does stand out. And I can't, I really don't know what to say about, you know, the fact that it's Garcia and Hunter 
and that I'm an old deadhead and maybe had listened to this tune for 40 years and somewhere in my heart, it's always been that ballad of, of struggle, perhaps. Um, but, you know, there was, it, it was truly, I just wanted to clarify, there was no music playing in the room. It was all internally. And um, what, it, the, I mean, the takeaway was that from there I did make a commitment to take a step forward. Um, because up, as, as I tried to explain, there was this huge team of people who I really felt had, had just gone so far to bring me right up to that point and that the composition of those people, this whole You've Got Us, was just mind-blowing. Um, you know, the person who greeted me every morning at Dana Lower 2 uh, and helped me through each day of radiation, each person who helped me coordinate the appointments. I mean, these are people we spend a lot of time with in addition to the concentrated times with Dr. Liu and Dr. Margalit and Dr. Chow. Um, and all of that really, at that moment, really did come into perspective and compelled me to make this commitment to um, go home and start eating, which really seemed, up to that point, a bridge too far, just to coin a phrase. Yeah, I remember that the Howard just mentioned that he said that just right as doing the acupuncture treatment, he suddenly realized he needed to take the, his pet out. He decided to take a big pet out just write that, and he took action, and he was successful. So that was, uh, it was sort of a moment of uh, enlightenment for some reason happening. Mm -hmm. so maybe there's some uh, biomedical uh, mm -hmm. uh, mechanism there, but we don't know yet. So, Dr. Um, as a follow-up, Dr. Manley, I'm just, one, one of the things I'm curious about is how have you been able to bridge this, um, the evidence is emerging, and uh, and how, how do you find that you and your colleagues in the department have sort of thought through of how acupuncture and the protocols of acupuncture, just as you have radiation oncology protocols, and how, how does that all fit together in a sort of an integrated perspective from as a you know as an oncologist? Um, how does it fit together for you with your colleagues? Yeah, 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 yeah. For you, I'm asking you as a as a physician. You know how this is it. You know because evidence is emerging, it's protocolized. And what do you see the receptivity in the current state um, at the cancer center? Um, I mean, I think firstly we're, as I mentioned, and and as have you as you've heard, there's so many uh, side effects of treatment, and you know, as we all know from clinical trials, you need huge numbers sometimes to detect uh, things, and so. Um, you know, while in some respects there's emerging evidence when we, you know, experience anecdote after anecdote in support, um, you feel incredibly, you know, favorable and supportive of it, um, even if the p-value doesn't reach always statistical significance. Um, and so we, I think as a program as a whole, um, we're trying to move the field forward and, you know, thankfully, we have someone, you know, like Dr. Liu, who is moving the field forward. And so, you know, in our program, and I'm interested to hear your perspective, too, I think in general where we can contribute, for example, providing space within the radiation oncology department to do surveys. We are, you know, mentioning it to our patients. We try and help as much as we can to... Um, you know, contribute to the success of the the um, trials, but but you know, I wonder what you think some of the challenges because again, sometimes you need these huge numbers to show you know p equals less than 0.05, and how you um, plan your studies, what some of the challenges have been. Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. That uh, uh, I think the study we conducted with uh, Henek, Dr. Haddad, in his group. Um, uh, for many years, it was long, many years of work um, to get these numbers, and it's, it's very challenging. But I think from another clinical practice perspective is that uh, I realized that uh, many oncologists, we are on the same, we are on the same um, page that uh, our goal is uh, make our patient better. So this is, no matter which perspective you are come from, uh, which is uh, disciplinary, uh, make our patient better, making them life quality better. 
this is our goal. And if acupuncture could do that, and they were really supportive. I really feel they are really supportive because uh, uh, even they may not completely understand what's going on, the, the mechanism or uh, 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 biomedical perspective, uh, but their patient coming back and tell them they feel better after acupuncture sessions, and uh, I really feel that uh, uh, our colleagues uh, on, on, you know, uh, oncologists, they are really support that, and they encourage the patient to do acupuncture. So we get a lot of referral from uh, head and neck uh, cancer uh, group. Great. And so we try to move forward to uh, understand it better and uh, do more scientific investigation. That take uh, money and effort and uh, time. Oh, uh, that's a good question, but <laughs> this is a big question, and uh, this, as I said, this is a very new field. Um, at one, another talk, I'll say, oncology acupuncture only 27 years old, and uh, if you're looking back at the first oncology acupuncture clinical trial, uh, that was 27 years ago. So this is a very new field, and there's a lot of things that are wide open in terms of the protocol. The protocol we just adopted from a clinical trial. So this is uh, right over there, and uh, some successful clinical trials, which is using their what they're using in their uh, the uh, protocol, and adopt it with combined with our own experience, and we make it their own team and the institutional protocols. So we have not published that we're using that, but we try to treat all the time, and uh, also we are we do planning to expanding and disseminate our knowledge, not just at Dana Farber, but also. Uh, whole country, maybe whole world, uh, about our model of practice. But stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Margulies, you were going to say. Oh, yeah. no, I was just wondering, uh, it, it would be helpful. Are there some specific considerations that you have, for example, if a patient is neutropenic or that are specific to oncology, acupuncture, or if yes. there's a lot of dermatitis in an area. Yes, we have a lot of, that's why I'm one of the, our one feature is the uh, lab-based uh, safety rules. We have many safety rules to make sure our patients are safe. Even people thought the acupuncture is safe, but it's not necessarily true. Uh, I really want those people who hear in the practice acupuncture to be aware of the risk of a practice acupuncture in cancer patients. Uh, particularly, as you mentioned, the neutropenia patient has a very low white blood cells. They were a very high risk of develop uh, infections. And the patient doing the radiation, their dermatitis and high risk of development infections if you needle that area. So you really clearly need to know where the patients are doing the treatment of the face. And so we avoid this area. We, so we do have a different phase of so what time of the treatment phase you, you allow to needle that area, what time you should step away from this. So this, uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, this uh, uh, rule internally set up, so everybody has to follow that. That's why we have this standard of care. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Nicole. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I saw you on your catalog. You also, besides head and neck uh, cancers, you also have other, ca other types of cancer patients. And I'm thinking of like breast cancer and other kind of patients. How, what is that? Uh, oh, thank you. So we have actually head and neck cancer only counts about 10% uh, of our population in, in the, uh, our Zikam Center uh, uh, Oncology Acupuncture Group. Uh, we see a lot of our breast cancer patients, and that's about approximately 35% of our population. We see other patients too. Yeah, we are. We get uh, the clinically speaking, they are very favorable re the results. We also conduct clinical trials on in the breast cancer patients, and uh, we just completed our randomized trials on the uh, neuropathy in breast cancer. We also completed another clinical trials on this uh, 
uh, infusion, ear acupuncture during infusions in breast cancer patients as well. So there's a lot of work and we do, but the, the, the interesting is for me as a practitioner, each time when I pre uh, finish a clinical trials, I look at the data, the data really inspired me. And I really feel more confident that acupuncture really work. And even before that, I have a doubt. And I have that, does that work? Even I treat every day, individual patients, they do get better. But as a whole, uh, collectively, do, patient, do acupuncture help cancer patients? As I, in this field, as I do more clinical trials, I see the data I produce, it really inspired me, yes. And each time I become more confident. And really we need to spread the word and tell patients and tell patients, tell our conventional colleges, uh, colleagues and uh, tell the whole world. And uh, we need to utilize this tech technique to help our patients and to make, make move this uh, field forward. I'm just gonna ask one final question uh, sort of as moderator prerogative. One, one um, is, uh, one thing of note for Mr. Smith, he, took out his pectum at day 79. And my, what I'm curious about here is that, it, and you had 60 or just under 60 treatments. So the cost of delivery of 60 treatments versus perhaps getting the peg tube, what is the, ex, does, it, does anyone have any sense of what the extra cost or extra burden would have been to say he, if he had it 160 days as opposed to 80 days? Uh, in a peg tube, and, and would that have been, is that justifiable? Because I don't know what the cost of, you, you delivered obviously quite a few, or your team delivered quite a few treatments, and and guessing, the, is that is that a worthwhile shift and to just, uh, and I'm just asking, not just beyond quality of life, but just thinking from the economics perspective. I think that's a, a tough question, because it depends on how you assign value, you know, and, and uh, you know, because the, from, I'll give my input, but but <clears throat> you know the 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 extra days, you know, there's the risk of infection and things mm -hmm. like that. But but the holistic impact on the acupuncture is, you know, not just the feeding tube, but the pa patient's emotional well-being, and perhaps you can comment the dry mouth, mm -hmm. which leads to long-term dental cavities. So it's very hard to capture that in a simple. Um, you know, in a straightforward way, and I imagine studies, depending on how they, assi you know, um, assign the cost and the, and the value, would probably come out, you know, in many different ways. But I wonder if you could comment, since you know, as a one of the closing comments, just you know, it was the feeding tube, but also it was sort of the state of mind to get to the feeding tube out. So I can expand on on one point I was describing, which was that with the feeding tube in place, I was more or less living a very isolated life and emotionally feeling very exposed and very vulnerable, not to mention the daily loss of weight, the difficulty staying hydrated, and on and on. And so that, to me, was a focus of everything else that was happening. And the point I made earlier was that by ha with, with the feeding tube gone, that then freed me up to get out of the house, and my next step from there was, to my good fortune, uh, participating in that Livestrong program, which I fully endorse for any type of cancer mm -hmm. patient, because for me, instead of being stuck in my house, not going anywhere, instead I was with 13 other cancer survivors, we were all exchanging our stories and our struggles and moving forward together. And so I'm not sure how, when you say what was how do you balance the cost? Um, but it, the value of moving forward was, was beyond doubt. You know, because otherwise, I mean, the, and the, the contrast between having the tube in and having the tube removed and being able to move forward, that was an extreme contrast. To echo on the Howard, the comments that, um, yes, I think uh, the, the value of acupuncture um, uh, from an uh, economic perspective, but we need to look into that and uh, um, give you one of the study. And in, in California, we had they have a, a, a abstract presented in the last year at SIO. Uh, they did on um, acupuncture in the cancer patient population. What they found is of uh, this preliminary data, the acupuncture actually does can reduce uh, emergency room visits uh, during the cancer treatment and the hospital stay. And uh, uh, so 
uh, from their data that was uh, economical, uh, viable, and feasible. Point. So we need more study on these. And uh, um, the, we also find, you know, for the uh, head neck, as Dr. Malika can, can echo on this, is that many head neck cancer patients, at the end of their radiation time, they will end up in the hospital and uh, because of the, the, the collapse. Mm -hmm. Great. And if we don't know yet, if acupuncture is able to reduce this emergency room visit and the hospital stay, and uh, mm -hmm. it will provide not just the spiritual value for the patient, mm -hmm. but also uh, you know, the real dollar sign for the whole entire medical system. Great. Okay. Yeah. I think that this is all wonderful, and I think that even if this could be achieved with sham acupuncture, it would still be helpful. So the comparison, right, between we don't know the difference between real and sham acupuncture. There's there's clearly something that we need to understand there. But even if this could be achieved with sham acupuncture compared with no acupuncture, um, that could still be extremely valuable. I think so. Future studies, I think it's very important to include a no acupuncture group, right? And it's more yeah. expensive to do studies that way, but. I think it'll be important in the future, given the results that you got, right? Well, I want to thank uh, everyone, really, for a spectacular presentation. Thank you to our, um, uh, our patient and our discussants. This is really amazing. Thank you. Uh, please, round of applause for them. Um, we invite you to join us uh, next, the first Tuesday of next month. Uh, Dr. David Michelin uh, will be speaking. Um, this is a, a well-known psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he's presenting on omega-3 fatty acids for mood disorders and other psychiatric conditions. Uh, so please join us um, uh, next month. And then lastly, um, we are, in the spirit of uh, improving our outcomes and recruiting, recruitment, we invite you to please look at the flyer that's in the table. We're currently studying chiropractic therapy in migraines. Uh, it's called the Impact Research Study, and uh, uh, they're actively recruiting patients. So if you have patients uh, or if you have uh, subjects or individuals that you think may be qualified, please reach out to Audrey right here, She's, uh, and she will be in touch. And we invite you to continue this dialogue across the hall to our coffee hour. Uh, and, uh, and again, thank you, everyone, for this discussion.